Okay. Um, well, I would like to uh, maybe uh, start with one um, question I have for Rosie. Um, I was wondering, uh, last year um, I was at the seminar where you spoke about endurance, and I thought, for me, that seems to be quite uh, a useful uh, and activating uh, concept. Maybe you can say a little bit about this in also to maybe um, get to a point where we can go beyond these uh, feelings of anxiety and exhaustion. Thank you. Um, so I didn't get uh, to um, the full extent of the, of the thinking about exhaustion. Um, exhaustion is, is, does not need to be pathologized um, because it is an intransitive state. There is something generative um, about exhaustion if you do a bit of a Spinoza's take on it. Um, if you turn it around, indeed, into a resource by which you <coughs> get rid of old ideas and bring in new ones, get some work done. And, uh, don't forget that Spinoza is the great Amsterdam philosopher set in the middle of the end of the Dutch Republic. He, he talk about our political crisis. He watched one of the greatest experiments in modern political history come crushing down. Um, it was, it was a, a mutation of quite some scale. In the middle of that, he writes The Ethics, which is a treaty about how to construct affirmation out of pain, out of despair, out of a sense of impotence. It's an incredible text that I advise you to you reread with the French Spinozis, whether it is Balibar or Deleuze, of course, or Negri, if we need to go there, the Hegelian Spinoza. But anyway, it's, it's that gesture that you acknowledge the extent of something that hurts. I mean, if, if, if the point of reversibility, irreversibility is 12 years from now, that we reach the point where the acidification of the oceans will become irreversible. And that's where carbon dioxide is being produced instead of the oxygen that we need. If that is 12 years away, well, you know, talk about dying and ways of dying. Um, but it's a question of ifs and buts. And, and thank God our children are getting mobilized, telling the adults what they should do about constructing a sustainable uh, future. But it is literally a daily gesture of constructing the positions, the possibility of endurance. And I think it's that, that it seems very humble, but they're massive gestures. And uh, learning to live with zero growth, and learning to desire poverty instead of desire growth and, and, and more consumption, change the social imaginary whereby the apocalypse does not need to be always tinted by Christian white male anxieties. We can actually look at it in, in a more lucid, in a more critical manner, and, uh, not, uh, not, not in any nihilistic sense, but in a constructive manner. So I think this idea, it, uh, the, the question of resilience is absolutely uh, crucial. Resilience is the corporate translation of, of endurance. Endurance is the the, 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 the ethical concept, the Spinozist, the Lersian concept, and the corporate translation is resilience, which is everywhere at the moment. You can read the mission statement of any major company, any university that will have resilience, they will have sustainability, and they will have diversity. And most of those will be utterly meaningless, but they have the concept. Um, and I think it would be very interesting to take those notions and give them an affirmative um, content, to turn it into something generative, productive. Um, so exhaustion, if it means that we get rid of the old schemes of thought, that we evacuate an old antiquated idea of the subject, and we welcome the possibility of redefining a common humanity that is not common by flattening the difference, but is common in the acknowledgement that we are in this together, but we are not the same. Acknowledging the perspectives and the differences and the common interests, that would be a form of commons, of communalism, uh, that may be the communism to come, and then I will sign up for that. But it, it requires getting active, and that is the opposite, of course, of exhaustion, impotence, and the lament. So the empowerment to act, I think, is the ethics of affirmation. We really need Spinoza, which means we need Amsterdam, we need the Sonic Acts. <laughs> Can I add something to that? Um, because uh, I think it's also important to, to link this to a particular history of philosophy, a particular uh, tradition in thought. Uh, we mentioned uh, Deleuze and Spinoza. The Stoic tradition has been mentioned, and it, I think it's crucial to see that 
the, the lamenting, yeah, the, 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 the very the deep Christian thinking that is uh, on the basis of this lamenting is uh, something we really need to get rid of or at least to be open about it, that this is a, a very Christian way of dealing with things. Uh, and that means that, uh, and that is, that is why we are interested in a concept like death. Uh, death is not something which is located in the future, which happens and we have to pray so that we'll have uh, a better future or that something will happen in the future. Death is at this moment at work. Um, in the work of Gilles Deleuze, you will find that um, uh, back time and again, eh, to, to scream at death means, uh, that's what when he talks about the works of Francis Bacon, means that you have to be uh, um, working with the idea of death, with the absolute problem of death all the time. And that means taking up some sort of responsibility. That means, that means finding new ways to live. And as said, that is, that is a strong history of philosophy there, which has been neglected for a long time within the university, still has actually. But uh, yeah, it, it needs to be revitalized in that sense. Okay. Um. Let us open up uh, questions from the room. Um, here we go. Hi, thank you both. Um, so it's a question to both of you about necropolitics and kind of the original definition of it, which Mbembe was writing in relation to the settler state. So I just wonder when you use the term necropolitics, do you also see it as um, capable of commenting on state power and how we relate to the state and maybe speculate on could there come for us um, some kind of state or some kind of other institution that would not be necropolitical? Is it possible to do so? Oh yeah, I just mean it from um, Achille Mbembe's reading of Foucault, where he was saying that the way that state rules life is actually by um, projecting death and making the subjects incapable of um, sustaining livability. And he kind of made it in relation to um, colonialism, so I wonder if that's still there. I want to make a short comment on that, because I think that uh, in, in the example I took, the, 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 the Justin Bennett, um, a documentary, I think is a very nice micro-political way of dealing with the state, and dealing with the state science and dealing with the state as an institute of oppression. Um, and uh, I think that what happens in the documentary is is that the state is put to silence and a kind of a, a new borehole comes into existence. So uh, I think there's a very interesting way of uh, playing with uh, a different form of life, uh, which is not uh, dominated by the state. But you want to talk more about necropolitics? I guess. Yes, Membe is uh, a very important addition. Is my uh, with Sarah Natal are the people that I work the most with on understanding how the governance of dying and death changes, but actually stays the same. To, 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 to cut a long story short, um, the. Foucault, as usual, has these great intuitions and then he dies too young, doesn't develop them. So we have like a paragraph on the Tanato political. And then we are left to fantasize what that he would have done with that had he lived long and well, which he did, and he died far too young and left us with a mass of um, sketches and, and intuitions. Um, so uh, Membe takes off from there, bringing in cr absolutely crucially uh, the critical mass of uh, race theory, um, decolonial, postcolonial theory, feminist theory, Theory, all the stuff that the universities never teach, and they should. It should be compulsory to anybody who wants to understand uh, the third millennium. So Achille gets into the stuff with all the French. He's a Senegalese, French-speaking, living in South Africa. So he has the French critical theory as well as the English critical theory, and um, talks uh, about the necropolitical as a highly organized, racialized political economy, um, uh, racialized and sexualized. Essentially, uh, the plantation. It's a plantation economy whereby labor is free because you've got your slaves. Uh, one dies, you've got another 300 to come. Uh, he has a, a sort of advertised drawings that I hadn't seen because I'm not a, a historian of slavery. Um, uh, the, the drawing, you can look it up, of how 
the bodies of uh, the slaves were organized in the ships that crossed the Atlantic. Um, the precision with which they calibrated the space that each of those bodies um, would occupy. It's one of those drawings where you see the profound rationality of the political economy of slavery, anticipating similar drawings that we will get uh, in concentration camps and the optimal, uh, maximal exploitation of a human body that is not human. Um, you don't do that to humans. So to go back to the question that we're not human the same way. So it's a racialized political economy that privatizes profit and absolutely abolishes labor costs. There are none. Now, Membe um, argues that in the present, and he's not the only one, um, you could put Piketty in there, that in the present economy, the fourth industrial revolution, we have a new rise of oligarchy and monopolies. And uh, Google, Amazon, didn't they just, Apple, didn't they just pass the trillion dollar marks? That is a accumulation of wealth that we have only had in the first industrial revolution, the, the revolution that Charles Dickens described and Karl Marx undoes. This is where we are at in our political economy, in the accumulation of wealth. Um, and all of us with apples and iPhones are right in the middle of that. And anybody who still has a Facebook page, you're making Mark Zuckerberg very rich. And he owes you money. And there is a whole movement, as you know, called data dividends, where people want a fraction of the costs of the, of the profits of, of, um, of, of Facebook that is selling your data. This one, it would be one of the great, I hope, points of resistance in the future. So Membe argues here we are in a political economy where we are privatizing, in fact, the motors of the fourth industrial revolution, destroying labor. Labor is, I think our IE, our robotics is going to destroy something like 60 million jobs, says the OECD. Not the new, new Marxist review, the OECD is anticipating the suppression of 60 million dollars. Are those people going to be happy and turn to democracy and to solidarity? No, they're going to be mighty pissed off and, and turn to very different forms of you know, radical protest, quite rightly, and, and unrest. So there is that part of the story. And the other part that interests us feminists and anti racists is the privatization of all the sector that is prison war surveillance. And the war machine is a private corporation. That's why we can't control. Drones are run by people that we don't know anything about. They're trained by gamers, most of them kids out of school, that we don't have access to because they are private. Prisons are a massive private organization. And prisons are, f are for people like Membe, but also for Angela Davis, a continuation of the plantation economies. These people are deprived of any civil rights, they really do not matter, and they are a very cheap labor force. Yes, transformation of the necropolitical on a scale that is staggering. What is the problem? The problem is that we love Amazon and we love Apple, and that we can't live without them. We are the problem. This is where you need Spinoza's politics. We are part of the problem. So let's do something about it instead of posing again with our great dialectical opposition. I'm against it, you know, but never mind. Can I just check my email? Uh, there is no massive insurrection on the horizon. There is the patient, laborious task of making a difference from within. And I think that is Foucault Deleuze after the failure of the May 68 revolution. <laughs> you know, it's humble, it's absolutely fatally effective, as anybody who's done LBGT politics, feminist politics, anti-racist politics will know. The personal is the political. Power hurts when you hurt, when you attack it really close to your practice. And the problem with the Anthropocene is become grandiose. And when things get grandiose, Rose is out the door because we have a lot of work to do and very little time to waste. Thanks for these interventions. I, I wonder then, are universities the place where these things happen? Um, and what are these new institutions that need to be forming? So I'm, I'm quite excited about um, that some things are falling apart um, in terms of the politics, especially in Britain. Um, so I'm interested in these new institutions that are coming out, and I'd be interested to hear your observations on those new institutions. No, yeah, just a short response. I mean, look at where we are now. Uh, I mean, we are two university professors. We're sitting here to give the talks that we want to give. Uh, it's quite difficult to do that uh, within the university, um, especially within the curriculum, 
So to change the curriculum, you need uh, a lifetime, probably. Uh, the the crises of the contemporary are very difficult to to kind of. Uh, although the two teachers want that and the students want that too, but it's uh, the university as a as a machinery is somehow incapable of dealing with that, and to our big frustration, of course, and I hope also to yours. Uh, yeah. So I'm the pathological optimist here. Uh, a totally contradictory answer. First of all, great question. It's a question that preoccupies a great deal of people, um, from the activists, um, professors as they call us, to our students who are between the decolonized movement, Rose Must Fall movement, the Fees Must Fall movement, it's a massive student mobilization the world over, but also policymakers, the European Conference University rectors, uh, the Coimbra group, um, uh, various uh, royal academies, some of which I'm a member of, are really worrying about this and saying, how is the university going to survive what's coming? Which begs the question of what exactly is coming. And what is coming is a fourth industrial revolution that is also known by social theorists, as you certainly know, as cognitive capitalism. Knowledge being produced everywhere. Um, Sonic Arts Festival, people should get credits for being here. Uh, you won't, but I mean, knowledge is coextensive with the whole fabric of the new economy. Um, uh, Amsterdam is also known as Amsterdam. There's, there's more knowledge being developed in this town, but so is Leipzig, and so are many other um, uh, towns east and west of the, of the former border. Uh, so if knowledge is being produced everywhere, what is the function of a university when we don't really control fundamental research, certainly not in IT, the big oligarchs, um, the monopolies control that, but cancer research, the psychopharmaceutics, all privatized. So but the war machine, which means surveillance and all the drones, uh, unmanned vehicles, apparently the new armies that the, the China and the USA are putting together are completely robotized. Um, and I had a discussion a few years ago with the, with the military academy in Breda, I never thought that they would be my allies, but we were united against drones. I, because I'm an old pacifist, and my Commodore, Commodore fell in love with him, the Commodore from Breda was against drones because they're suppressing jobs for the soldiers. And I thought, extraordinary. <laughs> and uh, we are trained to kill. We now talk about the state monopoly of violence. And we, we know how to do it. We have our ethics. Now, these machines come and they take our jobs of killing. Terrible, extraordinary. So the most, the most amazing alliance, to go back to why the, the concept of the assemblage is a very good concept, because you may have allies in the most unlikely places. For instance, a military academy. Extraordinary. So what kind of Mo what can the university offer in a time like this? So I think the university has incredible resources, um, uh, and I think we need to activate it in the right direction. Chomsky is right when he says capitalism is eating up the university. If we have universities that are run according to neoliberal principles, where the only thing that matters is money, how much money you make through teaching until you drop dead, through getting grants. If you get the first grant, you get the next 37, because it's the same people getting the same grants all the time. Awards. Um, there was an article in The Guardian about how much the big philosophers are worth. Somebody like Charles Taylor is worth about $7 million. Um, uh, Habermas, five. Butler, five. These are millionaire professors. Um, uh, and so, uh, so we have now categories of academic rock stars, some of whom are appearing in this, um, uh, in this festival, um, who really make money, serious money, in a way that the old monastic university never used to. A university is, legally speaking, a charity. We are supposed to... We are non-profit organization. So I think we need to take this neoliberal governance without making a recipe for too much poverty, but reduce a little bit the impact of money. I would be firmly on the side of the university as a civic institution. Look at a place like Amsterdam, my little town, Utrecht, or Bologna. Universities and cities are the same thing. They grew together. They developed a sense of a space where democracy means dissent, means protest, means resistance and cooperation. Universities are older than, than the nation states. They're older than the, than, than the Dutch monarchy. They're really old institutions. Bologna is 900 years old. Coimbra, 700. Oxford and Cambridge, five, six, 700. These are ancient institutions. Why don't we take the university as the model 
of the institutions, instead of taking companies, most of which are non-tax-paying buccaneers, criminal organizations, um, uh, not the bank as the model, but the university as the model, intergenerational transmission, construction of, of citizenship, diversity in the true sense of the term, and knowledge for its own sake. Let's go back to the basics. Um, I think you will find a lot of even conservative professors going for this. And there is there is something of an academic freedom that I think is the seed of what we're in the process of becoming. I would put my money on that. Not too much, just a little. <laughs> okay, there's a question here, yeah. Do you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm gonna try to make sense of this because it's a bit all over. Um, I just want to attach this idea of the present uh, you mentioned earlier, or the actual of uh, of the leus. That uh, if you look at it from a technological perspective, that the present nowadays is collapsed in the contemporary, and that is in a way how um, the cognitive capitalism is organized. That these machine learning models or AI, which if you want to call it like that, that it is built on historical data from the past, and it assumes that the world will behave in the future as it did in the past. So um, my question is um, that it actually assumes that a kind of paradigmatic change is not possible. And this is kind of the neg negative utilitarian perspective. Uh, so, um, and also uh, connecting that to the quote that you had from uh, Michel Serre, that uh, of course we live in an accelerated changing world, but our institutions are still the same. Well, I would also like to mention this also reflects on us, that we also have to invent our own practices. And I, and I think uh, you mentioned it earlier, and this is where maybe my curiosity enters, uh, transdisciplinary research. What, what kind of infrastructures are you organizing or what kind of methodologies are you inventing in relation to transdisciplinary research and especially connection to critical theory and technology? Thank you very much. We can talk on this for hours. Um, it has a lot to do with what we've already been discussing and uh, also on also on the role of universities because of, of course I, I agree with you. I mean I've, I've, I wanted to point out the fact that uh, the, um, the curriculum is in, in a way uh, difficult to change or sometimes impossible to change. But at the same time, I mean universities also allow us to be here and also allow at its margins, um, loads of very interesting events and 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 seminars and publications to take place. I mean, that's that's also the university, and I think that that is that is very interesting, um, especially in our times. Uh, and what way can we make use of these these margins of the university also to do fundamental social critique? Um, so you. Um, brought in again this notion of the present. As said, Deleuze wrote quite a bit on the idea of the present and on its, its ambiguous, uh, the, the ambiguity of that particular concept. So, because in, a, in one way, it, it, it refers to these, these ongoing machines and we can talk about the curriculum, we can talk about the economic, social and political powers that dominate our world, and at the same time, at the margins of the present, what I sometimes call this the contemporary, so, so what happens with the times, allows for a lot of social critique and a lot of, uh, someone calls it, <laughs> and a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, dissonance in that sense. Um, so, and, and that is why the concept of the present is very interesting, and that is why it's also very interesting, interesting to see how art can intervene in that, how art, in a way, does not have a present, and by that I mean that it does not, in itself, become part of all these machineries. In a way, it kind of, it, it's always a kind of an, an impossible relationship in that sense. I, I like that very much. I think it's very important. Same goes with philosophy. You cannot make money from philosophy, except Charles Taylor maybe, but, uh, and Habermas, well, okay, there we have two already. Uh, no, but the same goes for artists, of course. There's also artists who make a lot of money, but the art itself, in that sense, has a very problematic relationship, and nece it's necessarily problematic with money, 
with religion, uh, with, uh, with war, as Michel Serre talks about this. And I think that is, it's important to stress how uh, art and philosophy in that sense have a problematic but a very important relationship with the presence uh, and that we have to, um, in, order, in order to face um, death, in order to face any kind of crisis um, as we um, are now involved in it in the contemporary, uh, we have to rethink what art and what philosophy can do. We have to find new weapons in that sense. Could, to I, uh, could I shortly react? Yeah. Um, no, I, I just want to mention, uh, yeah, probably not <laughs> unfamiliar to you, uh, Luciana Parisi's cry for techno philosophy in a way that the engaging with the machine that it might reveal something inside as a kind of new alien beginning, as he says it. Yeah. And I think this is quite an interesting where philosophy and technology could collapse in, in one thing relating to the actuation or uh, activation of thought itself. I, I, and I this was just my curiosity if you experiment with this kind of approaches or tools of doing philosophy. Yeah, you, Luciana Parisi is one of our close allies. Yeah. I mean, we completely agree with her very uh, analytic analysis of how technology works, also how sexuality works. That's her, her other book, which is deeply fascinating. Uh, so, uh, yes, we should make this clear w once more. It's not about a movement against something. And that's what, uh, that's what we read time and again in the Leuze Guattari already, even when they talk about fascism, we talked about that yesterday, uh, the Guattari writes a text, everybody wants to be a fascist. Eh? We have to be open about this. And at the same time, we have to be very much aware that this is going on, also with us. And uh, so we, 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 when we promote or when we try to think about ecology or ecological awareness. It is not about pushing technology aside or saying, no, we want to go back into nature, uh, get rid of all the machinery that is important to us. No, we have to think of this anew, about a new, new alliances in that sense. I think it's very important. So that also means rethinking technology and uh, situating technology in a uh, more um, sustainable world in that sense. Just a quick note, Parisi, Goldsmith School, Irit Rogoff speaking today, uh, forensic architecture, those are the allies. Uh, cognitive capitalism has chosen a different model, a model that does not assume the continuity of neural processes, of cerebral processes. Um, on the contrary, from Silicon Valley to the transhumanist. Transhumanism is the most dominant school in posthuman practice and theory. They are assuming mutation, and um, they are assuming change. Um, I think that the headquarters of this is Ho Oxford, not just any university. Uh, Google the, the Institute for the Future of Humanity at Oxford. Um, read the program on the interface between humans and technology. <coughs> the director is Nick Bostrom, an extraordinary guy who has talked about millionaires, professors, ERC, has every single grant in the universe. The program is very simple, human enhancement, the transformation of the human. Why? Because our brains are slower than the computational networks which we have created. Seconds slower, but that is enough not to be able to control the drones or the computational system that run our stock exchange and consequently our economy. Answer, Oxford transhumanist, change the human brains, accelerated through implants, through neurostimulation. I'm not talking about science fiction and I'm not talking about something happening in the backwaters. Oxford University, millions of, 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 of euros, pounds of, of uh, uh, research funding to change the human, to manage the mutation so that we can perform as well in the machine. Talk about um, uh, cognitive capitalism and how we would intervene in this. We, we, we need a different type of posthuman critical thought or posthuman action, and that is the alliance that we are proposing. And there, the arts absolutely fundamental, but it's quite a battle um, because we are talking about capital. We're talking about the new economy. Um, and, and, and within that, uh, as unless we're prepared to throw out all of our gadgets and our technologies, we are enmeshed in it up, up to our brains, precisely. So, any more questions? Yes? Um, 
Hi, thank you for your um, talks. Um, the conversation drifted a bit from when I had this question, but I wanted to go back to the way that you finished the talk by talking about the um, personal is political and not thinking in grandiose um, forms. And it occurred to me, so I mean, that's kind of self-evident for me coming from my generation, as is post-structuralism, as is um, you know your own work on, on post-humanism, um, which is, kind of, as I came of age, was what I took as self-evident as opposed to, let's say, dialectics and other older models. So I'm very much kind of view the world in, in that sense. It occurred to me in terms of the personal being political that that slogan comes from a historical moment um, where labor conditions were perhaps at an all-time historical high, um, like the best conditions that we've ever actually had historically, where labor was freed up um, uh, by certain forms of mechanization that we could even start thinking about in a, in a serious structural way about rights for um, for people who had who have been disenfranchised for the majority of history, and since th that time, labor from kind of starting from my generation where I've, I've I've come of age has taken this kind of horrible turn that you were describing, and I wonder if the personal political is is adequate for the challenges we face um, with these new forms of labor, because exactly the personal is the, f the factory of the political. I, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm, if maybe, if maybe you could. Yes, thank you so much. Um, it's part of my strategy when I speak particularly in an audience that is that I throw in little nuggets from the past. So if, if today some of you discovered Olympe de Gouges um, and to Saint Louverture um, and the, the person was the political, then I feel that I've done my intergenerational uh, uh, counter genealogical work. I just throw them in there and see what happens. And the, the, the line of the argument is usually um, going elsewhere. Uh, it is born of a specific moment um, uh, and it undergoes immediate transformation. If, if you just do look at the history of feminist philosophy, feminist theory, by I think 76 already we have politics of location with the first Adrian Rich. Um, it becomes the politics of location. By 82, 83, it is, nobody talks about the personal, it's the politics of location. And the locations are intersectional. It's race and class and age. Um, then Sandra Hardin comes in a little bit later and we get standpoint theory, speak from somewhere grounded. And then postmodernist feminism comes in with differences and multiplicities, and we get the dialogue, Sandra Harding, Donna Haraway, Anzal Dua, all the black feminist theory is there, and we get situated knowledges. And then the Deleuzians come in, and we get the radical immanence. And, uh, and, and then conversations with indigenous black theory comes in, we get perspectivism. And all of this is part of a counter genealogy that you, we can enter at any one point. Um, and I think the importance of, go back to the university question, we need to teach this counter genealogies. Um, uh, feminist, anti racist, LBGT, indigenous people have worked their butts off cr critically to invent theories, methodologies, concepts. We've worked so very hard. I'll tell you just this because I'm old enough. When I did my PhD at the Sorbonne on feminist and f feminism and philosophy, there were three books. Three books. Iri um, Garay had passed her thesis four years before me, and her thesis was there as grey literature. But that was it. If you were to do a dissertation today on feminism and philosophy, you would have a library. Um, the work that has been produced over 30, 40 years, unimaginable. Black theory, indigenous epistemology, the way we work, the extent of that production. So this is the university that we need to have that teaches these counter genealogies. Rapidly on labor, xenofeminism has done the discourse very, very nicely. Labor has been transformed. Uh, on the one hand, I think Jody Dean will be very good on this, a new feudalism, new forms of unpaid labor, productive as well as reproductive labor. I'm an LBGT person, a member of the gay bourgeoisie. I'm very happy that Elton John can farm out his children to surrogacy, but a surrogacy is a new type of labor that we need to look at very carefully. And there's been huge discussions um, about this because it is also racialized. Um, uh, and we can all admire, we see what happens Sunday, uh, the film Roma, 
and the white middle class is showing how nice they are to their indigenous mates, but you know, it's very really hard to take at the same time. And I think we are at that moment where, because of the fourth industrial revolution, the question of labor becomes primary again. Um, and I think the, all the discussion about the, about the commons, about uh, universal income, should we tax the robots? Answer yes. Um, uh, should, we, <laughs> should we tax the, the oligarchy and the monopolies? Uh, answer yes. All of that is it's really almost a repeat of the first industrial revolution. Um, so I would plead for some genealogical continuity with variation and listen very, very carefully uh, to the post precariat uh, labor force and what they have to say about the price we pay for the fantastic fourth industrial revolution that we are going through, let alone uh, the 60 million people who will have no jobs at all. So a lot of work to be done here, um, but we love it. It's, we love those technologies. Um, it would be hypocritical to say, oh, I'm walking out and I'm you know, embracing San Francis of Assisi. May I remember, remind you that at the end of um, Empire, uh, of Tony Negri actually promotes the figure of Francis of Assisi as the critical intellectual, poverty. Are we ready to make that step and say, I embrace zero growth and poverty for the sake of social justice? And if we're hesitating, well then there you have the scale of the problem and the difficulties. Radical epistemologists can teach us the endurance that we need. They should be compulsory in any third millennium university. The reality is gender, post-colonial, not being taught at all or being cut back very seriously. Can I add something to this? Uh, I'm look, <laughs> looking at our, <laughs> the director, of course, sitting next to me. <laughs> um, I think what is important here is also to uh, take a closer look at the, the, the concept of critique. Uh, because um, uh, being part of a tradition, a longer tradition in critical thinking, it is very easy to kind of uh, have one generation and then the next generation says, no, we're going to do it entirely differently. Uh, even Jean-François Lyotard, uh, in, at the end of his life, already said that we don't have to position ourselves after modernity. We have to rewrite modernity. We have to take them seriously and we have to see in what way um, we can uh, write history differently and write the contemporary differently. I think that's very important also for intergenerational bonds and kind of rethinking the issues that are at stake now, uh, which have been different in the past, but in a way it's also kind of a, uh, a transformation of what we've seen before. So, the concept of labor is, of course, crucial to rethink the concept of labor, to rewrite uh, Marxism in that sense. Uh, to rewrite the concept of technology. Uh, but we can do that very much with uh, uh, the, the strong traditions, uh, which are definitely there. Uh, and some, some, I mean, contemporary feminism, is of course, has a, has a, has no, doesn't have a very long history, but also there, uh, I mean, if you look at uh, what has been produced over the ages, there's so many interesting work which needs to be rewritten in that sense. And it's no coincidence that uh, the both of us, but actually quite a number of our, our, our companions in that sense, also go back to the Stoics. I mean, it's 400 BC. The world was slightly different in those times, but still, the things they write, the way they talk about death, the way they talk about life, the way they talk about taking up responsibility, it can be extremely uh, important for the issues that we are confronted with today. Okay, so um, maybe a last short question, otherwise we're going to wrap it up. Yes, in the corner. Um, just to come back on the transdisciplinarity idea and instead of new institutions, kind of new assemblages, I like the idea that the university can be that site. I've embedded critical race theory into my teaching work with my students um, and with the public. I think there's a challenge, though, in how universities acknowledge other forms of knowledge. And so um, there's something, I think, that people that are different from me can do in those institutions to enable the possibility of recognising you know, indigenous knowledge and so on. W where are those professors? I'd love to see them, especially in European universities. 
European University, long way to go. Um, we have some postcolonial um, uh, chairs, uh, some work on history of slavery, notably in Leiden. Um, but uh, postcolonial is as good as it gets. But uh, indigenous studies chairs exist across Australia, Canada, British Columbia, and very, very active programs. Um, they do amazing work and, and have very pertinent things to say about the Anthropocene. To keep it uh, quick, I think one of the things that are happening that is, of course, a mixed bag is private universities. Um, now, private universities have always existed, not so much in Europe. Um, uh, but if you look, for instance, at post-Franco Spain, the Opus Dei set up a whole chain of brilliant new universities, um, uh, very much modeled on the Ivy Leagues, that would teach feminism in the sense of gender mainstreaming and stay clear of the race issue like, uh, like, like, like it was the devil. Um, very interesting phenomena. And right now in the UK, you know the growth of those private universities, including universities specializing in the humanities, because the humanities are being cut back in the state universities across the world, uh, which is another, of course, source um, of uh, the, one of the side effects unintended maybe of this post-human convergence. We don't need the old humanities and um, we need a different type of university, says cognitive capitalism. So the shutdowns have been enormous and private universities have embraced the humanities. Um, the last example I know is Italy where the publisher Feltrinelli, I think it's a few days ago, the publisher Feltrinelli is setting up a critical theory university that both shares in a private university in Milan and they will specialize on the critical humanities. So here we go, confronted head on to the issue of how we relate to cognitive capitalism. Should we do a private academy of serious critical theory with indigenous? Should this Sony Act become the university of critical theory, transversal, socially conscious, um, uh, giving credits and, and producing a legal charter? We, we may be heading for a strong corporatist discussion about the legal charters of, of universities. Think of how fascism, when it goes to power, I'm thinking of Orban in Hungary. What is the first thing that they do? But first of all, they attack the Jews and the gays, and then they attack the university. The CEU, the Central European University, had to move from Hungary to Vienna because having Soros Foundation money is contaminated by liberalism, Judaism, and critical theory. It's happening right now, this very minute. I don't see a mass mobilization um, to, to defend academic freedom here, but the first thing the fascists do is they go after the academics, the students, um, the, the critical thinker. First thing that happens, and this is actually in the process of happening in this continent again. Um, so our new work that we're doing with Rick is very much on how to lead the non-fascist is life, how to connect critical theory as the creation of alternative, because we both affirmative Spinozis, to resisting this rise of fascism that is absolutely palpable and to a certain extent justified by the economic discontent caused by the fourth industrial revolution, only to a certain extent because the return of anti-Semitism and racism really needs to be looked at very critically. And in Brexit, it's just absolutely written in the script, um, but across Europe at the moment as well. And the Anthropocene lament seems not to be hearing these other sounds that are coming from our citizens, sounds that we need to be very alerted to. And we cannot repeat that history, but we are sort of tempted, shall we say, at the moment. So I think it's connected to the function of the university as a school of democracy and critical dissent. And that is not uh, a point of consensus, on the contrary, it's being attacked. Um, so we need to defend that and on that basic, I think, maybe look whether we could have a university, I think Achille Membe calls it the distributed university. It will be distributed across civil society, but with a clear um, ethical, critical, democratic core. Um, we are the university, we are uh, the academics who have been here for centuries speaking truth to power. Now get a life. Um, and I think that, that that has to be the mode of this, I think. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to have a warm applause for uh, Rosie and Rick.